Welcome to the Ask Brian Podcast Radio Show, where you'll hear from some of the most successful founders and CEOs of businesses and startups, sharing their best advice for success, and even some stories on how their mistakes actually make them even more successful. Now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tracy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're listening to the Ask Brian Radio Show on KHCS 1220 and 98.1 FM, like no other station in the world. Wow. How do you do that? Do what? That little voice like that. That's it's, really cool. it, it's, it's a talent, what could I say? You really do. Maybe you should become a voiceover person. Maybe. I'm pretty good at doing voices. Yeah, well, we've heard those voices. <laughs> okay. Now... Everyone who has not listened to the S. Brian Radio Show, we've been doing this now for four years. We actually started in January. Our first show was January of 2017. So it's, it's four and a half years we've been doing it. Uh, my co-host, Tracy, we just had our one-year anniversary, I think it was last week. So we've been doing it. Yay! Woo-hoo! Where's my present? We talked about this last week. It's my present. It's my anniversary. <laughs> you gave me a present. <laughs> I am your present every single week. <laughs> I'll have to go out in the garden and get some flowers. You know, I can actually play uh, play like something for you, just like a. Thanks, sweet. <laughs> now you got some things. Where the where's the drum roll and all that other stuff? <laughs> My God. I don't have a drum roll, but I do have like a. And, that's... Uh, and a bell. Okay. You know I hate that. (laughs) Doing it. He's the boss. You asked for it. You got it. All right. It feels like an episode of the Addams Family. I was thinking more like Rocky Horror, but I don't have any popcorn. That's a good picture show. All right. So we got to get a little serious here because we have a great guest, and I'm really very informative. We want to get all the information from him. But as everybody knows who listens to the show, S. Brian is spelled with an E. Nobody knows why. And we always have to explain to that. So I'll go over the first three so we can kind of get quicker. The engineer begins with an E. We're all experts. And we have a lot of enthusiasm. And we're all excited to be here. So, he took basically about half of them away from me, so... There are a number of different, you know, words that start with an E that have to do with the Ask Brian Show. It's almost kind of like a theme of our show. He took away the engineer, enthusiasm, excitement. I think he took away experts, but if not... That is correct. He is? All right. Well, that starts with a C, but gotcha. (laughs) Experts starts with an E, but okay. Yes, it does. (laughs) Uh, You might need to go back to school. (laughs) No, he said correct, and I said, anyways... (laughs) We had a new one from last week, but I've already forgotten what it was. And that was the one that you're the one that came up with that one, too. Oh, no. Oh, I know what it is. Tracy, I remember. I actually remember. It's energy. Energy. Bingo. We have excitement. Energy is a good one, though, too, because energy doesn't always have to be excitement enthusiastic. Yeah. But you have to be energetic. Yes. Bingo. To have good energy. Well, we have an mm-hmm. energetic guest that's going to be on very shortly. There we go. Once we get through this charade. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd really like to get through it. <laughs> well, then l- allow me to just and like... by the way, his name begins with an E. Ooh, it does. Well, without further... <clears throat> am I going to say it? I don't, I, think, do? I don't think you're very empathetic. Ooh. <laughs> Hey, oh, that's another one. It's empathy, <laughs> which no, I'm empathetic. I'm empathetic to our guest who's having to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> Jay didn't warn him. That's the problem. Anyway, is there anything else on the east? Well, we already covered empathy uh, experience because everybody is very experienced in what they do here on the Ask Brian Show. So, without any further ado, Eric, are you there? I'm here. I feel like I fit right in with starting with the letter E. And I'm amazed that you were able to sit through all that. So for that, you should get an award. (laughs) He should get, like, the applause button for that. Where's the applause button? You know what? Actually, no, I I, I can't. You you had it before? All right. No, one last time. (laughs) One last time. That's for you, Eric. That's for you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for being on. I prefer the Adam Family (laughs) sound music. (laughs) Tracy's like, no. I will be be snapping my fingers like they do on the show. (laughs) (laughs) But this is actually the S. Brian family. And you have a very, very great background. And all our viewers or listeners want to know about it. So 
I know right now what your background is, but before you got into your business, South Bay, why don't you give a quick, brief background, a couple minutes of, of what you did before, and then what your current company is, and then what you do. Sure. So in my, what I call my past life, I used to be a jewelry designer in downtown LA in the jeweler district. It was a family-owned business, and we used to sell directly to jewelry stores across the country. And so when the Great Recession happened, things started to slow down. We couldn't give away a diamond suddenly in 2006, 7, 8. I'll, everything I'll, slowed down. I'll take them. I would have yeah. taken one <laughs> if you had given me one. <laughs> I wish I knew you both back then. I just said pay for them. I'm I take them. Stay <laughs> late, a dollar short. Dang it. <laughs> So uh, what I did was while, you know, getting out of that economy, I started to educate myself on this thing called marketing and really locked in on this up and coming thing called search engine optimization and digital marketing. And I really took to it. And in time, I started to do uh, campaigns for friends and family. And at some point, I started to do some consulting for just making some money on the side. And it took on a life of its own. And uh, here I am. That is really interesting. So without a background in SEO and maybe doing it for 10 or 12 years, it's pretty amazing. I would think most people that I would talk about in SEO would either A, be former marketers or coders, you know, something in the IT world. But, to, you know, that's a whole new area to learn. I know for the content marketing, et cetera. So what can you tell us? Give us, if you can, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you can't, we'll do sure. it later. Give me five tips for SEO to rank. Five tips. Well, first of all, you need to make sure that your website is quote unquote optimizable. Okay. If let's say, for example, you go to a website and it takes 10 seconds to load, that's not something that Google is going to be happy about. So they're not going to rank you probably. If you have broken links on your website, if it's not mobile friendly, if it's not a good user experience in general, like if you go to the website, and there's pop-ups all over the place, or you go a couple pages into the website, and then you backspace and the page is expired. Things like that, where you feel like, okay, let me just go to another website. I, I'm fed up with this site. So make sure that your pages are tagged correctly so Google can read it. A lot of times what happens is with e-commerce kind of sites, you go to the website and you tag the page, the stock number of the items. You know, 214XYZB28. Google doesn't know what that is. So you have to tag each page that, hey, this is a lady's red polka dot sweater, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. And so that way Google knows that, you know, this is the about us page, this is the product page, this is the services page, contact page, et cetera. So that way when Google goes in, in a split second, crawls your site and spiders your site, within a split second, it knows what every single one of your pages are about. So How that's long the first that? thing. You said 10 seconds is too long. What would be an optimum speed? And then, and also, how can you, how can you get an optimum speed? Sure. So it's usually a second or two. We lose interest at some point. We're just waiting. We're just so spoiled. We want everything instantly. And you, you got to keep in mind that uh, mobile is where Google is actually optimizing and scoring you. So mobile, especially, you have to make sure that, you know, pay extra attention yeah. there. So a second or two for that. Now, as far as reducing load time, Sometimes what happens is you have too many plugins on the back end or you have too many things going on on the back end. So you have to watch out for that. And the most obvious thing to look at is the picture. Sometimes the graphics are just the, the files are too big. And so there's an app that I use. It's called GT Metrics with an X at the end that you can go. It's a free, you know, if you're doing like one or two tests at a time, you can go and put in your website address there. And it'll do, within about a minute or two, it'll give you a diagnosis on how it thinks the website is doing. And then it'll say literally, like, these 10 pages here, it's just the files are too big or, you know, these three pages, something's off here. And it'll point you in the right direction. So if you have a programmer or you have an IT person, you can kind of point them in that direction. That, that's very informative. So that's the first step. Okay. So the second step is, so we have our website functioning properly. Now we want to figure out what keywords do we want to rank for. So generally what we do is if you have a user that's sitting in front of a computer or on their cell phone, they're in front of the search box of Google, Yahoo, or Bing, and they're going to search for a service or a product. What would they search in order to find your service or product? That's what we're going to be looking into. So generally what we do is we start off with keywords that the website is already ranking for. 
And then we get an idea what the business owner keywords they would love to rank for. So we have, we put together a report for that and we see where we're at. And then we ask for anywhere from five to 20 competitors and we see which keywords they're ranked for. So there are tools like SpyFu, Ahrefs, SEMrush, uh, many of them out there. You know, there's a subscription, monthly subscription for it. But you can put together a list of competitors and what they're up to. Basically, what it is, is it'll tell you your competitors rank for this keyword. They're ranked number three. And the monthly search volume is, let's say, 500 searches a month. So you kind of get an idea of what's happening out there. Because a lot of times when we ask for a keyword from a client, they give us like the top level keywords. Like back in the day, the mistake I made when I was doing jewelry was I went after the keyword jewelry. <laughs> And it's just, you know, am I, am I looking for someone that's selling jewelry, buying jewelry, repairing jewelry? Do they want an appraisal on their jewelry? And if they, if they want to buy jewelry, are they looking to buy watches or gemstones or diamonds or engagement rings? You know, there's just so many subcategories out there that on the off chance that I'm going to rank over Tiffany's and Cartier and all these companies that are just huge and I'm going to jump ahead of them, which is next to impossible. But even if I do, I'm not going to convert many of those keywords because it's just such a generic keyword like jewelry or gold or silver. It's, it's just not something that, you know, you want to be a little bit more specific. I don't mean to interrupt, but, you know, yes. also, though, when you have long term keywords, you know, and long tail, I mean, it's called when you have a long tail keyword, then there might be only very, very little traffic for that. So if you did, you know, uh, jewelry watches made out of gold that were made between 1922 and 1924, you know, that's your long-term <laughs> keyword. You're going to have, what, maybe one or, or zero traffic for the month. So you can't go to the other extreme, right? You have to pick. Well, you know, no. what we did was we ran some reports and we saw, okay, for example, the keyword, let's say men's platinum diamond wedding band. So we have that exact line of jewelry. It may get 200 searches a month for it, but we're going to rank in the top three for that keyword if we optimize it correctly. And we're going to get a percentage of those visitors to come, those searches to come to our website, and uh, we're going to have a higher conversion rate. So we went after a very specific niche kind of keywords that are lower in volume, search volume, but they're higher in conversion rate. Okay. I mean, this is all good stuff. I mean, uh, I hope the listeners understand this is really good stuff. Uh, it's almost like the secrets of an SEO person. People don't really know this. So they hear about it. They know, hey, I want to I want to write, but you know, I'll save my PPC money for this, but you know, they, they really don't know how to do it. So this is a, actually very informative. It's interesting because we have up until COVID and hopefully once COVID passes, there's a search engine academy that I uh, would teach at for search engine optimization class. And it's funny because most of the people there aren't looking to become marketers. They just are frustrated with giving, you know, spending money on digital marketing and not getting a return. And they know that that's where the future lies is in digital marketing. And so they just want to come in and understand what upsets Google, what makes Google happy. How do I get ranked? How do I read the reports? Where do I find the reports and things like that? In relation to that, it's very important as well, because when Google has a penguin update or some other update, you know, that affects you. How does that affect? Uh, I still want to go through the five tips and we'll, we will be taking a break All in right. two minutes, but, but can you... <laughs> I can talk for hours on this. So <laughs> no, I, I, it's <laughs> very me. Uh, my co-host, I'm sure, wants to get some questions in too. But I would like to get the five tips, though. But I also, you know, you're providing a lot of information, a lot of informative stuff, and I think uh, everyone that's listening, like myself, is learning, and that that's always good. That's the of goal course. of our show. So why don't you go over the next tip? Okay. So the next one is reputation management. You want to make sure, you know, I could say all the great things about myself, but if you say something good about me, it uh, resonates more online. And I think in life, it's just uh, a reality of things. And so you want to make sure that you're receiving good Yelp reviews, Google reviews, Facebook reviews, and be sure to reply to all of your reviews, good and bad. If you have a good review, thank them. And if you have a bad review, I don't know about you all, but when I'm searching for something and I go on their Yelp page, I look at the negative reviews first. I go to the one, two stars first. And I want to see what the brand is doing when someone is complaining. Because you're not going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. It's just not realistic. So, but if the brand says, you know, we're sorry you had a bad experience. How can we make it right? Or we'd like to offer you this because of your troubles or whatever. That shows me that they're trying. Sometimes I see brands where they get a negative review and they complain to the, like they insult the person <laughs> online. 
And that is not what we're looking for, you know? <laughs> What's wrong with revenge? Be careful with that. <laughs> revenge isn't good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, true story. I had I know of someone who owned a restaurant, and someone wrote a review and said that they had anger management issues, and then their response was angry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they were very transparent, though. So without any further ado, if you could go over some more tips, our audience is loving it. Sure. So. The third one that we touched on was reviews and reputation management. And where we left off was be sure to thank the people that have, that think highly of you and the ones that have had problems with you. Try to make it right with them. Stay away from getting into uh, altercations online and, uh, you know, going back and forth in an angry manner. So the fourth is, ironically enough, most people don't think of this, is social media. So Google is watching your social media campaign. So let's say last month I had 90 followers on my social media. This month I have 100. Next month I have 110. People are following, liking, commenting, sharing my content. Then that's going to be a good metric for Google to see, as opposed to if I haven't posted all year and then I post and nobody likes it, follows it, shares it. I'm losing followers every day You know, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, wherever you are. You have to make sure that you have a consistent social media campaign also. And for social media, we're referring to what? Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? Does that include uh, you have to add on Pinterest? I mean, how, how far do you go when you say that? Well, you want to hit the, I think, the top three at least. So that would be what? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook? It depends on the industry, really. You know, But obviously, the ones that have the most, the biggest audience are Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, so you want to make sure that you're on at least those three or Pinterest, you know, put in an extra fourth one there. Not Twitter? Oh, I mentioned Twitter. Twitter. Oh, okay. Oh, it was Instagram that you didn't mention. Okay. I figure I always lump in the two with Instagram and uh, Facebook. Okay. And uh, if we move on to the fifth, since you asked me for five, the fifth is going to be a practice online called link building. So let's say, for example, on my website, I write a blog article about you and I make a clickable link from my website to your website. That is a link coming into your website. So the more websites you have pointing to your website, the higher authority you're going to have in the eyes of Google. So this is one of the more difficult practices because it's difficult to entice people to give you links coming from their site. So you have to create good content. And then once you do that, you can reach out to them and say, hey, you know, you have an audience that would be interested in this article or this video or this infographic, whatever the case may be. If you like, put it on your website. The only thing is when you do that, when they put it on their website, they have to credit you for it. They can't pretend that it's their content. And so that's how you you have link building campaigns. And who would you typically send that to? I mean, you don't want to send it to support, right? So who are you sending it to uh, at the at the site? It depends. A lot of times there's you know, you go to a website and there's the contact templates or the contact, you know, contact app and just whatever generic email that they have that's on their website there, you would contact them through there. If you have something that, you know, they can see on social media also, maybe you contact them with a direct message on Instagram or a tweet or something like a direct message on Twitter in different ways to get their attention. I wouldn't spam them, but make sure that they see your message. I have one last question, and Tracy has a whole ton of them, but the next question I have is, so when Google does those updates, right, I mean, that obviously affects everything that you've been working on, and so how do you how do you handle those situations? So I'll give you an example. Back in the day, there was something where, as far as link building, since we're on the subject, you can do something where I do a link from my website to yours, and you do a link from your website to mine called link, uh, link exchanging. And so what happened was, as marketers caught on that this is a good way to do uh, link building, everybody was doing link exchange. And so that's not what Google was looking for, though. Mm-hmm. Google's looking for a one-way link. It's looking for something that you do organically to say, hey, my audience, you would be interested in this video, picture, article, whatever. And so when it made its algorithm change, people were, websites were penalized for that. And it's not like Google tells you, hey, don't do this, or you're going to get penalized. So you really have to be in those circles. You have to be in touch with marketers and things like that to make sure that those things aren't happening. A lot of times what Google is trying to do is deliver the best possible user experience to the user. So it wants to make sure that you're not kind of pushing yourself 
into a, a ranking that you don't deserve. Like if you're doing fake links, if you're doing uh, cloaking, if you're doing, let's say you buy 10,000 followers on Instagram and you show it as, you know, you suddenly you have a, a, a following, things like that. They don't want fake reviews. They're, they're keeping on top of things. So when there's an algorithm change, sometimes websites get hit in a negative way. And we've had situations where our competitors suddenly fell off a cliff and we're, you know, our business is booming because we're doing it organically. We're doing it what is called white hat as opposed to black hat where you're trying to fool Google and get around them, and which is a silly concept because you're not going to fool Google, Facebook, Twitter. So uh, Tracy had some questions. Uh, go ahead. Well, I want to stay on this link building for a second because I just I wondered if you would just walk through again because it feels a little confusing. So you are saying, so if I have a blog post and I um, am talking about, you know, a, a restaurant that I just really like personally and, and I'm like, and you need to check out this menu item and I put the link to the restaurant in there. So w what you're saying is, is that that because that's authentic and genuine, it's in the context of the blog post. So that's something that because that I would highlight that link, hyperlink that link, then that's something that Google would recognize. But I don't see how that's building the relationship because like you said, they're not linking back to my site. So where is the gray area on that? That's the piece of the puzzle that I don't really understand. Sure. So let's stick with your example. You went to a restaurant, you loved it, you have a website or a blog or something, and you talk about that website. And hey, everybody, this is a great website. They had a really good pasta uh, special or whatever. And uh, if you're interested, click here to go to their website. And you give them a clickable link from your site to theirs. So what's happening is the restaurant owner isn't, you know, they're not in on the conversation. I'm sure they're thankful that you're giving them a link. But a lot of them, unless they know SEO, they, they're not even aware that you sent them a link. Right. So the more links that are coming to that website links that are coming to that website, the more their authority is going to go up. And obviously, not all links are created the same. There are a lot of uh, links out there, or websites out there that, you know, have a domain rank zero. The scale goes from zero to 100. I've never really seen 100. But, you know, if you have too many links coming in from, you know, the zeros and one, that's not a good thing either. So you want to make sure that you are getting links coming in from higher domain authority sites. Okay. So if you're, so let me use this as another hypothetical situation. So let's say that you are a, in the service-based business and you have a portfolio of clients that are on your website. So you're showcasing like testimonials and, you, and you're showcasing client work that you've done. So should you click, like, let's say if you're a web designer, this is a good example. If you're a web designer and you build websites and you want to show a portfolio of clients of other websites that you've built, would you then link the portfolio pages to the actual other person's website because you would be maybe considered more of authority because you have more portfolio items? Or should you keep them, just have screenshots of the work that you did and keep them within your site so they're not going off to another site? So a lot of times what you see is you see screenshots. Um, but if you want to do a favor to your client, you can give them a link. That's a link for their SEO juice. So that will be a link coming in from your site to their site. So that will help their SEO ranking over time. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So you, we were talking um, at the break about podcasting, and obviously podcasting has had exponential growth over the last few years and just really blown up. And, of course, our listeners know that I am a company called Producer Podcast, where we produce podcasts for clients. And we are often asked about audience growth strategies around SEO. Is there some specific things that podcasters can do that because it is primarily an audio platform and those podcast audio episodes are distributed in the Spotify's and the iHeart's and the Apple podcasts of the world, is there something that podcasters can do to leverage SEO to help people discover their podcast? Absolutely. So that's an awesome question. I think that that's something as podcasting has gotten more and more popular. It's been around for a while, but it's just kind of, I feel like in the last couple of years here, it's caught fire. We use it for content creation. So I'll give you a textbook example. Let's say I did an interview with somebody on a particular subject. We jumped on a Zoom call, for example, and we recorded the conversation. 
It could be video. It could be audio only, depending on what the client is interested in. And so we can take that content, upload it to YouTube, and then from YouTube, take that video, put it on a blog post, and embed the video onto the blog post, and then transcribe the content. So some people want to listen to it. Other people want to watch it. Other people want to listen to it. So this is a way that we are able to create consistent content with clients. Which is great because that, you know, oftentimes we talk about you can actually create the content one time. So in the case of the podcast, you would create the content one time by either recording it on audio and video, like you're saying, have that transcribed and then have that repurposed into blog posts or newsletter content, for example, which is not going to ultimately enhance your SEO, but it's still good content repurposing. And then social media, which I did not know until today that Google paid attention to your social media. So when you're posting an episode, for example, on social media, is should you be posting a good amount of content from the show as well, like maybe a quote from the uh, a quote from the show within a social media post? Or are they just, they're not looking at individual posts as much as they're just looking at growth and engagement of your podcast or your social media platform? They're looking at everything. So when you look at your, when you're on YouTube, for example, you have your analytics there where it shows, you know, you had today 100 views on this one video and half of them, le- it's a 10 minute video, let's say, and half of them left within the first 30 seconds. And then the most of them stayed for the remainder of the video. Like you could see where the fall off is. And so Google is watching everything and taking your data and trying to decide if it wants to rank you. Kind of like what it does with uh, your Google Analytics for your audience that have a website. They better have uh, this free tool by Google, which is called Google Analytics that you plug into the back end of your website. And you can see literally where people are coming in from, what kind of device is it, mobile, tablet, phone call, if it's a mobile, what kind of phone are they using, just all kinds of data that you can use. Sometimes you get lost in it. And one of the metrics that Google is really locked in on is time on site and how many pages that an average visitor goes to. So if we embed the video onto the website, your time on site is going to skyrocket, which is going to be, you know, it's something that really helps with your SEO. Because if I had today 100 visitors that came to my website and 98 of them left in an average of three seconds, that's going to destroy my SEO campaign, no matter what I'm doing with everything else, with the reputation management, with the uh, link building, everything. But if I had 100 visitors coming to my site and the average person was staying a minute or two minutes, then it's going to be my campaign is going to be different. So this is something that when we create content, obviously, we upload to iTunes and Spotify and everywhere else. But also, we, we do a campaign to keep that audience in our, on our website. So uh, some people wanted to know how they can reach you and how they can contact with you. So if you can give them that information. Sure. So our website address is thisismysouthbay.com. I live in and grew up in the South Bay part of Los Angeles, and uh, I'm passionate about it. And uh, I show that uh, website and our social media almost like a case study for small businesses that are looking for local uh, or hyper-local search engine optimization and digital marketing campaigns. And if they go to my website, they can, if they have any questions, they can click on book now and book a 15 minute free consultation on any questions that they have on SEO. Uh, if they want to run some reports on their competitors or on their website to see what keywords they're ranked for and, you know, any questions that they have on digital marketing. And then you said that you're a partner with Yelp. So can, people don't know what that means. So basically we're a Yelp advertising partner. So. It's almost like when you have a question with Yelp, you call Yelp and then you, you know, you're on hold for a while and you have to identify yourself and you go through these, you know, you jump through these hoops to to be able to ask your question. And so for us, we are the person that you would reach out to if you have any questions on how to set up your campaign. Usually we set it up with the client directly and, you know, we keep track of the keywords that are working well the ones that, you know, maybe it's costing them a lot of money and they're not getting any conversion. And so we are kind of like the the broker in between the client and Yelp. And I don't want to know if this is too far, but so are you getting paid by Yelp or are you getting paid by the client or both? No, the client doesn't pay anything extra. If anything that, you know, um, there might be a small price break for the client. It really depends, but you know, it's not like the client is paying anything extra. And it's a way for us to meet clients and prospects. And uh, a lot of times 
the clients that are marketing with us, we need to do a reputation management campaign and there's no one bigger than Yelp right now. So it's good for us to be able to move the ball on reputation management directly through Yelp. And currently, how, about how many people working for your company? We have about 12. That's that's quite a big, that, that's not a small little place. And then <laughs> about how many clients do you think you have? A guesstimate. You don't have to give me an exact number, but 100, sure. 200, 500? No, it's under 100. And, well, uh, when you're a high touch place customer service boutique firm like yours, though, that's not unusual because you're really doing a lot of custom work for your clients, I would imagine. Yeah, it's not it's not something where you go and you fill in the templates and off you go. It's it's very hands on. Like you said, it's a boutique marketing agency, and it's it's a uh, you know clients that are looking for you know that extra level of uh, service, kind of like the example that we just gave with Yelp, where we're you know uh, we're holding their hand through the entire process when they're signing up to Yelp and running campaigns, uh, looking at the data and seeing where they want to put the money next month. We're with them every step of the way. How long does it take to get a word SEO to get ranked? Typically, I know that's oh, that range, but <laughs> it, that's that's a difficult question to answer. Something to I don't have a exact or even a range really, but I will say. If you're looking for immediate results, SEO is not the place to go. Thank you very much. You're listening to KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM with my co-host Tracy. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ask Brian radio show. You can listen to us every Thursday on KTHS AM 1220 and FM 98.1 or via Facebook Live or anytime wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit AskBrian.com to join the conversation and ask us your business questions and we'll answer them on our next episode. That's AskBrien.com.